Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to get us started on our last session. And, and um, certainly this is going to be a very interesting session, much as the others are, but this is very pertinent to the, the challenge that every one of us is facing right now, and that's dealing with the pandemic, the COVID-19 virus. And uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor Yossi Sheffi, who is the director of our center, the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, as well as holding a number of other positions at the Institute. He's the Alicia Gray Professor of Engineering Systems and uh, um, uh, has been a very prolific producer of relevant material in, uh, in the, the entire supply chain domain, but particularly in our world of uh, resilience and the challenge uh, for supply chains to be resilient. I would have to, I would argue that he's the world's foremost authority in this subject matter, particularly evidenced by all the, the great content that he's produced and shared regarding COVID-19. And we're fortunate to have him today to share some of that with us. Yossi, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Jim. And hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for staying to the last. I hope to keep it worth your while. So we'll talk about COVID-19 and we'll cover the, what, should, what should corporations do now, how they should look at customers, what will happen in the next year, year and a half, what will be the new normal after that, and what the supply chain look like, and a comment on environmental sustainability beyond um, the current period. So first of all, you know, there are many, many risks. And we usually talk about random phenomena, things like, um, uh, you know, natural disasters, accidents can derail um, what we do. Politics, of course, when we have tariff wars, when we have other issues. Uh, Non-compliance can bring companies um, to their knees. Competition can come from unexpected places. You know, sure, Apple, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, Nokia never thought that uh, going from 67% market share to 3% market share would be done by a computer company that never been uh, in the business. Uh, the economy, we're now living it, but we had before a um, significant downturn. This is very significant downturn comparing probably to 1930s. Uh, issue with the uh, social discontent when people are uh, demonstrating against the use of animal, against using fats, whatever. Uh, intention disruption, of course, when we have issues like uh, terrorism, but also intention disruption in terms of uh, work, work uh, walkouts and things like this. And finally, we're gonna talk about pandemics. So they're all very different. And I like to quote the, what I call the Anna Karenina principle. So the story wrote the happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. We usually say that every disruption is different. Every disruption comes with only litany of misery, disasters, causes, no two are the same. It is true, however, the management of most risks involves certain principles that are applicable to almost all of them. Uh, prevention, detection, response. So there are generic preparation steps and then generic response steps. So what do companies are, are doing? Um, they should think about having an emergency management center to get all their uh, uh, information in one place. We'll talk more about all of this. Think about how they communicate, how they make decisions, how they look at suppliers, how they look at decide which products and customers to keep supplying, what do they do about their finances, and how they plan for recovery coming out of the uh, COVID-19 era. So when I talk about emergency uh, operations center, when I talk about it is a general is a place where a lot of information comes into and decisions are being made there. Uh, it's a general information decision-making function. It looks something like this. That was before uh, the current pandemic. Right now, most companies operate the centers like this virtually. They are responsible for taking care of employees. So right now, they are looking at employees, how, how they're doing at home, how the families are doing, do they need any kind of help? How do we bring them back? They're taking care of the business ecosystem. How do we keep operating when, when we are under the COVID-19 regime? How do we keep operating when customers completely change what, uh, what they're buying, when they're buying, if they're buying at all? 
and taking care of communities. Many of these large companies operate in, uh, in community and selling to areas when there are communities that they have to take care of. And just as an example, this is the emergency management center of um, Walmart during a, a small hurricane, a big hurricane, there'll be a lot more people, but it's a small hurricane trying to manage the response. Right now it's done online. This is the emergency management of American Airlines. There's nobody there. Nobody is flying right now. So the next thing that we have to talk about is crisis communication. How do we communicate to the various uh, constituency that people should, that companies should be communicating to? So set of all, having ready communication to all stakeholders. What I mean by that, it used to be that we needed the envelope to send the uh, letters to everybody. Right now we need everybody's email address and we, we need to have a script, a script for each one of our, of our continuous, uh, constituents. And the constituents are employees and customers and suppliers and the media and shareholders and analysts and the community. We need to communicate clearly and consistently to each one of these constituents. Most importantly, speaking with one voice. Uh, the company should get its act together and speak and, and communicate all this information consistently. Uh, we need to know who is in charge. Uh, if you recall, after uh, President Reagan was uh, shot, uh, General Haig went on television and said, I'm in charge. And actually, he was not in charge. Behind the president is the vice president and then the speaker of the house. The uh, Secretary of Defense was not the next in command. The next thing that we should think about is give accurate information. Is, and when I say accurate information, accurate information is also, I don't know certain information. I'm still looking at it. So is what we know, what we know that we don't know, what, so I'm saying, I'm still looking at, uh, say, our what is the, the, uh, um, the significance of antibodies? Are people getting actually immune or not? Well, we don't know, but we are looking at this with gusto. We're trying to understand it. The world is looking at this. And then there are things that we don't know we don't know, are still unknown. We don't know how long this will take. We don't know if uh, um, some uh, vaccine will be developed, will be effective. A lot of things we don't know. But Communicating this and admitting that things that we know, things we don't know is extremely important. In terms of decision making, I call it uh, swim your own lane. There are many examples when uh, there's, a, there's an emergency operations center that has all the information, has people who understand all the intricacy of building the product and understand the customers. Invariably, in several of the uh, um, crises that I was studying during my, the time that I was writing uh, my books about it, some VP came in and made a decision, or CEO came in and made a decision, just do this. Invariably, it was the wrong decision. Uh, product are complicated, customer relationship are very nuanced, and it's very important that people, close, that people closer to the action will take responsibility. Bill Belichick, who anybody from New England knows and loves, and anybody from outside knows and hates, used to say, do your job. That's the idea. Don't do other people's job. Just do your job, what it is that you are responsible for. Very important. We look at suppliers. Uh, we have to, um, if we're uh, lucky enough to do what's called supplier mapping before, before this started, then we're in good shape. Supplier mapping tells us where all the suppliers are, not where the headquarters are, but where the, um, the actual plants are. So if something happened in this area of the world, we know immediately what products are being made there, which, uh, what parts are being made there, which products are going into, which customers are being served by this product, so we can alert the customer, we can make, uh, uh, make some decision. It has become, it used to be a huge, exercise for a large company, a large complex company. It's now a lot easier because there are actually companies who are specialists in doing things like this. 
So they, and they can be very helpful and do it relatively quickly. Uh, in terms of supply, you need to know, as I said before, what do they make is, is it critical? How critical it is to your operation? Which customers are being served, as I said before? Of course, inventory level throughout, throughout the supply chain and the supplier. The capacity that, that the supplier can recover very quickly. Or how long does it how long does it take for the supplier to recover? Can we look into the recovery path? Can we look into the supplier? Do we know them? Do we, can we get good information there? Now, that certain thing to watch for when suppliers get in trouble or have the, the capacity impeded, things like uh, quality degradation. Some, in some cases, we've seen suppliers that reduce quality, dilute certain uh, acids that go in, uh, into the product without doing the right quality control. If you see late delivery and order uh, errors, it's usually a sign that the uh, management is looking somewhere else and not taking care of you or, or our other customers. Of course, you look at the financial health of the, uh, um, of the supplier to see you know, how long they, are, they will be in business and you have to communicate with them continuously. Finally, as supplies dry up, we see a lot of fakes. That happened in every crisis that we ever had during the Japan crisis, during the Thailand floods, we always have when there's a shortage of supply, new companies are coming with fakes. We see this now even with uh, masks and other PPEs, L huge um, shipment from China turn out to be subpar, not good for use in, uh, in hospitals. Uh, Holland said that they uh, had to throw out 600,000 masks that were some part, and it, it happened even in the United States. So this is something to always watch for, for fakes and uh, stuff that's very, very low quality. Finally, at the same time that you are worrying about cash, and as we go into the, uh, the current recession, and we are planning to go into a recession, um, of course, you try to, to manage cash. Instead of managing for profit, you manage for cash flow. But uh, when you start lengthening payment term to suppliers, you put the suppliers in risk. So you have to think about both worrying about cash and supporting critical supply. And this can happen in a lot of ways. You can use your um, uh, credit to help the supplier. There are lots of, lots of ways of doing this. I don't have time to go over all of them. What happens when you don't have enough supplies? How do you decide who to give it to? Well, if you have limited supply, one way you can do is allocate. You can say, okay, I cannot give to everybody, so I'll be this product and not those product. I'll serve these suppliers and not those suppliers. How do you decide? Well, one way to do it is based on margin. I'll just build the product and serve the supplier where the highest profitability. This can have repercussions, however. Uh, this is not generally viewed as a fair deal, and customers may, uh, may retaliate later. In fact, there's a case, a dramatic case like this, is the auctions, when during the Thailand floods, Western Digital was, uh, was hit very hard, and uh, Seagate, the competitor, decided that it's good time to do an auction. They'll give the disk drives or short supply to the company who pays the most. Um, so, you know, customer had no, no other opportunity, so they pay. But as soon as the flood, uh, flood receded, Western Digital became number one again. Every customer that could move back, move back. Um, talk about dilution, that's one way to reduce product quality. Uh, there are cases when simply reduce product quality, but the dilution sometimes work. Intel, for example, during the uh, Japan crisis, diluted some acid that it uses in the, in the chip making process, but of course they did with a lot of quality control and uh, uh, made sure uh, that it worked. Finally, you can shape the demand. There are companies who are, if they don't have certain um, parts to make certain products, they raise the price of this product, but reduce the price of product of which they have a lot of. 
So they, they try to move customer through pricing to, to the product that they can supply. You have to as also not, this is what you do right now, but you have to start planning for the recovery. You have to worry about keeping expertise in house. You have to worry about treating employees right. If you can continue to pay, all the other companies are now playing, paying all their employees because they don't want to be caught in a situation that trained people will leave the market. So they take care of employees and families. They also allow part-time work. Interestingly, in Germany and Holland, uh, they changed labor law uh, in order to, um, to make sure that people can work half time and they'll get unemployment, only half of the unemployment. This was not allowed before and they changed labor law. Suppliers will remember how to treat them, how to treat them, how you treated them as well. So take this into account. However, not everything is uh, lovey-dovey. A, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, and this is also an opportunity to make some tough business decisions. It's an opportunity to do the reorganization that you always wanted to do, and the company always needed to do in your function, and there was also resistance and you couldn't get people to do it. That can be time to do it. For example, cutting non-performing products and customers, that may be the right time to do it. In fact, we see retailers and food companies and, and other, other manufacturers cutting down a lot of their um, assortment and focusing on a few items that they can supply consistently and build inventories. Let's look at the next 12, 18 months as the country is opening and see what is likely to happen. And let me just say that uh, as I uh, said before, forecasting is difficult, especially the future. So what I'm now doing is forecasting. Um, opening the economies. Um, first of all, the economic impact, the recession is likely to linger for years. That almost nobody thinks any, any different, aside from some happy talk from certain quarters. Um, but countries and states are starting to open up. In very interesting to look at the Swedish model. Sweden did never close the country. They gave all the information to people, and many people stayed home, but others did not. This is what happened. This is the weekly rolling, rolling average of fatality in uh, Sweden, getting to about on the average. Uh, this is the days since they first discovered the, uh, I think the first case or the first three cases in, uh, uh, in the country. They, did, they never closed. And I should just say that this is a logarithmic uh, scale, but they got to about 100 a day, 100 a week of uh, um, cases of, of, of fatalities. It's interesting to, they're a country of about 10 million people. Interesting to compare it to the UK. The UK closed very late. And they are, they are now running at the, uh, about 1,200, 1,300 a week in average um, in terms of uh, death. Uh, Norway, for example, which locked down immediately, got, has less than 10, it's about eight, now it's about six death a week. A uh, country of uh, about half the size of, uh, of Sweden, but uh, 10 times less uh, less death. Similar, Denmark, very similar, got to about 12. The country is a little bigger, got to about 12, but they close immediately. They close right at the beginning. They look at other countries and say, oh my God, they close. So it's really interesting. What we see from here is closing late doesn't quite work. Closing early is the key to success. Uh, we'll see what happened. Sweden gives us an, a a test case in how we can do opening societies. Um, so it's not clear who is right. It's not clear that uh, Sweden is wrong because we may still have a second wave. We may still have, a, we still have a second wave when Norway, Denmark, and others open their economies. Now it's a choice between multiple 
option. It's not like you either close or open. The trick is, of course, to find a balance when you can open. We're not working at MIT, but how do we open the institute? How do we bring people? How do we conduct research when some people are online, some people are in, uh, in other countries? How do we bring undergraduate, which are mostly Americans, how do we bring them back on campus? And we bring them in waves and not everybody in the, uh, in the dormitories. But there's a lot of thoughts about continuous testing, about tracking, about uh, not, um, it's really interesting, not forcing people to come on campus, especially students. But after six months, if they don't want to come on campus and we feel there are no cases, everything works. Uh, explaining that doing research at MIT is a privilege, not a right. So we treat it this way. So nobody is completely opening or closing indefinitely. There's always, you know, in all the plans to, to open it, there's a middle ground. And the question is, will the subsequent wave be worse? Will we have, there's a lot of people who think that the next wave, when people are start going out, will be worse. I'm not sure because this does not take into account the fact that a lot of people will voluntarily stay home and not, uh, especially people who are uh, older people, people with, uh, uh, with all kinds of conditions. The important thing, the only reason that uh, really, that the Sweden model was, you know, not every country should use the Sweden model is because it could overwhelm the hospitals. In fact, the United States got very close to overwhelming hospitals. Boston just missed it. Boston is not gonna overwhelm hospitals, but uh, came very close to, to overwhelm, overwhelm uh, hospitals. Um, so we're witnessing a natural experiment around the world, and we should take a note and make sure that we study what everybody's doing, understand their success or their failures and learn from this. So what will the recovery look like? Some people say it's gonna be a V recovery, we shoot right back up. Some others say it will be an, a U recovery, which is, you know, go down, stay down, and then going, going back up. Some people say it's an L. We'll, for years, we will be in a, in a recession. And some people say it's gonna be a W. We'll have the second wave and then get back up. I think a better way to think about it is a whack-a-mole recovery. We will have a random flare-up, shutdown, reopening around the world in random times and weeks. We will have people opening up and then they open maybe too much and they'll see suddenly infections spiking up and they'll close and they'll shut down factories again and they'll shut down stores. The, the question is we have to be ready for it and think about how to manage it. So the question is, in this case, it is so random. What's the value of a supply chain strategy? Uh, it's important to, well, first of all, it's important to stay with tr trends will continue. In fact, we see a lot of trends that are accelerating after the, uh, the coronavirus case. And always keep testing, testing your assumption, of course. So what's the value of planning here? Well, uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, plans are worthless, planning is everything. And clearly, no one plan can anticipate what's going on. But planning, looking at various scenario, is very important because it socializes and conditions the organization to think about various outcomes. So you plan for reactive response. And several companies are putting together what they call local tiger teams. They are watching for areas of the globe and have teams that are just looking at this area and listening in, uh, they're listening to several things, not only local hospital and social network, but HR in plants of suppliers. They think, are these people doing social distancing and masks and gloves as, uh, and, and testing as they should, or are they just being uh, cavalier about it? And they'll have another uh, flare up. All these targetings are coordinated by the emergency operations center that I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. Other strategy, some strategy, for example, that helps in this uh, case is postponement. If you don't send the product, but wait with it until you commit a product to a certain, uh, a certain locale. So the new normal, this is the uh, handshaking with the new normal. So the new normal in the coming year, clearly we'll have a recession. 
And the question is, what will sell in the recession? Turns out that we saw in 2008-2009 low-end sales and high-end sales. High-end sales because people who buy Rolex watches are usually not uh, influenced, that, you know, by uh, by the recession, not affected by the recession. So people, a lot of people buy the low. We saw that Walmart did very well in 2008-2009. The problem is middle of the road offering. If you are kind of middle of the road the supplier, middle of the road retailer you will be hurt. And in fact, we see many of the large retailing, retailers are in fact closing shops. Uh, we will have inflation. Um, you cannot put trillions of dollars into the economy and not suffer inflation down, uh, down the road. And you have to, the usual balance is between, you know, cost and level of service. But now a lot of us, we look at resilience as being able and risk management, resilience, and there will continue to be pressure on an environmental, but I think we'll come, we'll come back to this. The last topic I'm going to talk about is uh, environmental issues. So one of the things that uh, will be a new competitive advantage is safe zones. After 9-11, we created safe zones in airport, in shopping malls. If you go to uh, countries like Colombia and Israel and others, shopping malls, kindergartens, are looking like airports. You just cannot just go, go into them. Um, so this allowed people to start flying again. They now felt safe to go on an, on an airplane. With COVID-19, there'll be another type of safe zone. We will have to create minimal infection danger. So areas when people can congregate without fear um, and Doing it right would be a new competitive advantage, but we need to create different type of safe zone, uh, looking at it from healthcare point of view. Uh, the new normal, of course, will be masks and uh, still a lot of working from home, uh, a lot of Zoom, and yeah, a lot of uh, homeschooling. Um, let's look at post-COVID supply chains because I think there's a lot of stuff written about it that uh, one has to examine critically. So the media is talking about the failure of supply chain and the end of just in time and the end of reliance on China and all reshoring. I'm not so sure. So failure of supply chain, a contraire. This is their finest hour. I actually wrote a blog about it. I think it's the finest hour of, of uh, supply chain management. Look at the food supply chain. No restaurants, no institutions, change of, so half the food that's being, uh, you know, plucked and manufactured go to restaurant institutions. Change of item consumed. Very few people are buying fresh. A lot of people are buying flour and bread and beans and canned goods. Completely change the demand pattern. So it's less fresh, more canned food, more bread, pasta. We see plant closures here and there. And still, of course, the media shows us this. The media is responsible, by the way, for a lot of the uh, uh, panic buying because, of course, you know, if it bleeds, it leads type of, uh, you know. This is the picture if you come at night when the, when the supermarket is closed. If you come in the morning, it looks like this. All these pictures of empty shelves were taken at night. Only nobody told the consumer, say, empty shelf, my God, let's run for the hills. So to me, the fact that the food supply chain is still working is amazing. And it's uh, something that supply chain managers in this industry should get a trophy for. It's uh, impressive. So I don't see a failure. I see flexibility and adjustment to an extent that's uh, hard to imagine. Just in time, the end of just in time. No, it's not gonna be. The Toyota production system is one of the most important innovation ever in terms of manufacturing supply chain. So yeah, it calls for minimize, minimizing inventory, but the result is also resilience and flexibility, ability to respond to demand changes because information can travel very quickly throughout the supply chain. It results in high quality. That's how Toyota almost decimated the US auto industry 
uh, a few decades ago. Um, low waste, avoiding bottleneck, controlling for variability, you get low waste. These things are, the result are low cost, high quality products that you cannot do without. So people will still use just in time. They may keep in certain places higher inventory, especially when you talk about um, things like medical supplies. There are about 150 medical supplies that will be need that are that the United States does not make in the United States and are done uh, overseas. I'm not sure that the solution is to move them into the United States or to keep uh, uh, inventory at the point of sale but rather treat it as we treat the strategic petroleum reserve at the time when we thought we don't have enough oil, there was a central reserve. And we can talk more about it, about where to keep the central reserves. Actually, my latest uh, influence blog on LinkedIn talks about this. Will people get out of China? Well, I'm also not sure about that. Uh, many companies are not in China do only to low cost. Low cost, by the way, is diminishing advantage in China. In many industries, cost is becoming, is going higher. Um, those that are going for low cost, like certain garment manufacturer, are moving to other Asian countries. They're not coming to the United States. They cannot justify the cost. So they're moving to Vietnam. They're moving to Indonesia. Uh, they're moving to Bangladesh. But they're not getting, they may be moving out of China, but not to the United States. Other industries that are what are called sophisticated product industry, automotive, high tech, aviation, uh, there's a whole infrastructure of Chinese, supply, Chinese suppliers and ecosystem that offers innovation, speed, capacity, responsiveness that is hard to match elsewhere. It may take many, many years to build similar capacity elsewhere, and I'm not sure it's uh, the time may be passed. You may not be uh, able to do this. I don't see. Um, this taking place. Uh, you can't find this. And however, I, let me just say that company may ban us procurement. They may still do 70, 80% of procurement in China and have some Western suppliers just, just in case at least that they're not going to be shut down uh, completely. Uh, but at the same time, some companies with Western suppliers want to balance with some Chinese suppliers. Finally, let's not forget that China is still a very large and growing market. Companies cannot just not go to China. Medical supply, it's a, it's a different story. To avoid the repeat, uh, people are talking to build US manufacturing capacity. Let me give you an example. It makes no particular sense. Uh, 3M makes N95 masks. Um, they, worldwide, from factories all over the world, they make 50 million. N95 masks to make. N95 is the gold standard of, uh, of masks. Um, the ages is the government thinks that we need 300 million a month just for healthcare workers. Forget what other people work. People in industry are using them. People who work in, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of dangerous industries. But 300 million are just, you know, so something here. What does it want me to do? Ah, uh, so can you see this on, on my screen? Okay. No, just your slides. Good. I got some kind of stupid announcement. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so many more required for industrial workers, and anybody in contact with the public will want them in the new normal. So we don't have enough capacity to make them. And the issue is currently it is mainly healthcare, but there's a there's a lot more of this. So the question is to understand how we do medical supply. Think about the medical supply chain, uh, the, the the medical devices and pharmaceutical supply chain. So there's all these plants all over the world, and these plants are sending product to uh, basically to a number of distributors. The distributor industry in the United States is very concentrated. About 80 or 90% is held by the four or five largest distributors. And from there, it goes to hospitals. Sometimes it goes from China or elsewhere to local 
manufacturer Johnson & Johnson, they take some uh, compounds from China and they, they, they sell it either to the, uh, um, to the distributor or to the, or to the hospitals directly. Remember this, this supply chain because the question is, there are about 150 critical pharmaceutical medical supply not made in the US. Uh, solution one is build local capacity. That's what many people are, are calling for. Um, but creating US capacity to manufacture, I mean, much more than we need is very wasteful. We'll have idle machinery and worker when there's no once in a hundred year storm. A different uh, uh, solution is inventory. Hospitals can keep some inventory and can be stress tested, right? Like the banks are being stress tested, so they keep enough cash. Um, we can also keep uh, the main solution is central inventory, but unlike the strategic petroleum reserve, it should not be in a central place in some, uh, you know, mountain in Omaha or whatever. Uh, the question is what, because also you need to avoid expiration of, uh, of pharmaceutical, so it should be held by distributors. Distributors should have a much higher inventory in order to, uh, um, to operate, and this will be a live inventory, it will keep going, it's just that the carrying cost should be paid by the government, just like the strategic petroleum reserve. A strategic petroleum reserve, the government pays for everything, here's just the carrying cost. And the idea is that this distributor will not be able to go below a, below a, certain, uh, a certain level, a certain inventory level, without approval that maybe the president or somebody uh, at that level. So they will not be able to use it to modulate day-to-day -day fluctuation and they avoid the cost and quality issues that come with too large uh, inventory. And this should be audited and should be uh, uh, reported on. Now, of course, machine and medicines are not enough. You need medical technician and doctor and nurses that are also in short supply and getting you know, work to death. So the solution is probably a national guard, a medical national guard. Just like we have a military national guard, we'll have a medical national guard when people are working, let's say, a weekend a, weekend a month. You are a dentist, but you work a weekend a month in the, uh, in the hospital and come for two, three weeks a, a year in order to be trained on, uh, uh, on new machinery and, uh, and new procedures. Um, Finally, what about environmental sustainability in the new normal? Right now we have some wins, you know, we see the pollution in China during the height of the pandemic was, and when China was closed was significantly less. Uh, NO2 level in, in Boston are down by a quarter. It is quiet in the street, much nicer, but you know, much less recycling is going on. Uh, now we have a ban on multiple use bags. We want single use bags. E-commerce gives us so much packaging that it clogs everything. So the question is what's next? What will happen as, the, as we start to open up? So air travel clearly down, down for the count for a long while. Big conferences are not gonna happen anytime soon. The question is, for example, people who transit use. Um, I think there'll be unbelievable congestion in the streets because people are gonna use their cars. People will avoid using buses and trains. Uh, will avoid cases when they interact with other people. There'll be a lot of incentive to restart the economy and that's what people may pay attention to and not pay attention to environmental sustainability. More e-commerce uh, with, uh, we'll go back to, you know, same day delivery or two hours delivery, which is really not a good way to, uh, to distribute product. Low oil prices. Low oil prices means that the whole renewable economy is in question, at least for a while, until oil prices will recover. The question is how far will they recover? As when oil prices are low, people are using more uh, you know, it's, it's less, it's, it makes less sense, economically at least, to buy, you know, an electric car, for example, or a hybrid car, when oil prices are so low. And after the financial crash, emission recovered 
immediately, relatively quickly to an all-time high in 2010, just a year after the, uh, the crash. So in recession, consumers are likely to focus on cash and economics and not on, uh, and buy the, the least expensive product rather than the product that uh, is uh, built responsibly. And companies will focus on staying in business, growing their business, and again, focus on economics, and I expect a lot less on uh, environmental sustainability. The one uh, bright note that I see is that sustainability and, and resilience intersect. If companies after the, after when we come out of this, will companies start very diligently mapping their supply chain down to the plant and second and third level supplier, second level tier supplier, they'll know more not only about the risk posed by the supplier, but the environmental and social um, practices of that supplier. So they can, by, just by knowing who they are, they can put more pressure on them. Anyway, so let me stop here. And uh, there's a, if, you want, uh, if you want to read some books that are, don't talk about this pandemic, these are my, uh, my two books on the subject. And uh, on, my, on my site, there's a lot more material, a lot more papers, uh, Wall Street Journal articles, uh, several of my uh, Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg appearance, CNBC, and, and many others. And mainly my LinkedIn influencer posts that uh, the last three or four deal with the, with the pandemic. Anyway, so let me stop here and turn it over to Jim. Great, thanks Yossi. Um, well, we have a bunch of questions. One of them is an uh, interesting one from Amir Shahir. And Amir asks, do you think COVID-19 accelerated the need of AI in supply chain? And if yes, how do you think AI can help enhance supply chain? Okay, that's a complex, complex question. A AI is, is a family, it's not a, so if we're talking, for example, when people talk about AI and supply chains, one of the biggest um, application is forecasting. We all want to be able to forecast. So better forecasting clearly helps supply chain. Better forecasting would have had zero impact in this case, because when you have something a, the most sophisticated AI, the most sophisticated machine learning would have no impact in this case, because when you have such um, structural change in the demand, think about it. All the machine learning was working on the uh, was working on the on the data from the last year, two years, three years, trying to figure out seasonality and product and what people buy and this on. Everything is out the door. You cannot, you cannot use any of this. Now, as we go forward, what will happen is, I don't think this particularly related to, the, uh, to this. In fact, if anything, some companies will restrict their investment in, in CapEx in general, uh, capital investment, and uh, this may include using technology that is more, that they are not comfortable with. The, uh, look, people will use it on an experimental basis here or there, but you're talking about on a, you know, industrial scale, it, it will wait. I'm talking about supply chain. It is used on industrial case by Facebook, by Google, by others, clearly today. Uh, but in terms of supply chain operations, in certain areas, yes, in certain reading documents, you know, natural language processing of documents, stuff like this. So in, in spots, yes, absolutely. It's, a, it's an application. If you have a problem and AI is the best solution, people will use it. But I don't see right away a big push to invest in technology that a lot of people still consider new. Okay, thank you, Yossi. Uh, Jared has a comment. Dr. Jared Gensel. Oh, hey, Yossi. Um, I agree with your assessment of the whack-a-mole uh, recovery, and uh, we're going to be dealing with, I think, some degree of social distancing for a while until we have a vaccine. So how do you think that affects productivity across the supply chain? 
So for example, CDC came out with guidelines for the meat industry and said they have to do social distancing, you know, instead of being next to each other, they have to be further apart. That cuts productivity at the plant. This happens in warehouses where people have to arrive in shifts at different times. How do we replan our supply chains around this kind of temporary new normal? Yeah, I actually um, wrote about it. And uh, what will happen is we will have reduced capacity. There's no two ways about it. If we have in a warehouse, in a production plan, um, there, I don't know if you saw, there was a, two or three days ago, there were interviews and, uh, on public, uh, public television with the CEO of uh, Ford and with the chairman of Ford and the CEO of GM, and they show how they're gonna work in the future. Well, there are stations far apart, with plastic, uh, you know, dividers between them, people with, uh, you know, gloves, and people are being tested when they come in. Temperature is being taken. All of this will reduce capacity. People who work in, you know, people may have to add a shift and work around the clock. Some people come in the morning. They will not be able to have the same number of people at the plant at the same time, at the warehouse at the same time. Rule of picking and packing at, at the warehouse will be different. For example, uh, people will be able to go just like in retail store now, only one way along the, uh, along the aisle. So it will take a little more to pick, uh, to pick each package. The good thing is that we have what I think it will accelerate is the move to robotics in warehouses. Uh, that's a move that's already very strong and uh, I see it accelerating. Uh, robotic on the manufacturing floor to the extent that um, uh, it works, but robotics in warehousing is now so widespread and there are better and better machinery, better and better AI, in fact, that runs these robots. So uh, we'll see more of this for sure. But we have to get, this means that costs will go up at the time that people will have less ability to pay. It's not a question of profiteering or taking advantage. Costs will just go up because you'll have to, um, to use more people to do the same job. And Great, thanks, Larry, what, about, what about middle management, the productivity of decision makers? We're all making decisions on Zoom meetings. Does that change too? I don't see it. I think that uh, we get used to it amazingly well in terms of, of making decisions. What happens is we work longer hours, for sure. I mean, I... I'm on Zoom <laughs> 12 to 14 hours a day, and I'm not making it up. It's just that uh, uh, many of you don't know, but there's a, at MIT, we start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and that's all, usually my second meeting of the day. At 8 o'clock in the morning, there's a meeting of all department heads every day. Uh, all departments and center heads about how do we move forward in terms of education, in terms of research, in terms of discussions going on, and then it, it, it goes down. Then I have discussion with people in the center. <coughs> so this is, uh, it, I think it's working. I, I don't see problem with this, but it's more pressure, more pressure of working at home. I don't have young kids running at home, but people who do, you can see it on Zoom. Yossi and Jared, thank you. I've, uh, I'm going to go over our last question to our friend, Bob Ferrari. Bob asks, Yossi, how do you view sales and operations planning in the post-COVID-19 normal? Is the process far more tactical and focused on agility? It's exactly what I was going to say. And, <laughs> you know, the answer is in the question. The, the, I think that the, we will have sales and operation planning in much more broad strokes, and we will keep doing it more detailed, more frequently, and as information is coming in. For example, I talk about a rock and recovery. A, an area in, in Spain now goes down and suddenly, you know, infection go up and they close, you know, the whole Catalan area. Well, we may have, there's a port there, there's a, um, you know, it's a big, big consumption, big manufacturing area. If you have operation there, if you sell there, you have to respond somehow. If you think it's a long, it's a long term, you may have to start moving um, parts out of there. So you, uh, you move it to other factory or, or product. So being able, that's what I talked originally about the, um, 
the role of the tiger team and people paying attention to certain parts uh, parts of the world many of them should be local so they they listen to the local vibe and start to uh, to understand quickly what's going on and then feed it to the emergency operations center that basically what the emergency operations center is doing the last detail of the um, SNOP plan because that's what they do what the SNOP they look at supply and demand and then how to connect supply and demand quickly when the situation changes so yeah they, they have certain manufacturing and they want to have more than one supplier in a certain area and they want to have some more inventory possibly that would be the general SNOP decision but then uh, responding to immediate challenges would have to bend frequently and as they come Yossi, thank you very much. I want to use this to, uh, to close and say uh, thank you to a great many people, including our presenters, Yashen Huang, Tim Swagger, Muriel Medard, Alexis Bateman, Donna Palumbo Mealy, Wojciech Matusik, and of course, Yossi. I also want to say thank you to my colleagues, Kent Cottrell and Dr. Jared Gensel, for joining and participating in the discussion. And then also a thank, a thank you to Arthur and Dan and the uh, comms team as well as all the staff at CTL that have pulled this together. Um, but uh, very importantly, I wanna say thank you to all the participants for joining. We really appreciate you investing your time in this. We think that we've hopefully made a little bit of a dent in understanding what some of that uncertainty is in the future that applies. Um, I think we've left also some things for you to think about, the development of some of these different technologies and um, uh, capabilities and how they may apply to the supply chain in the future. It's a it's an ongoing discussion that we expect to continue to have.